Good morning. My name is JJ Sutherland uh, with Scrum Inc. I'm here this morning uh, for something that has nothing to do with Scrum Inc. whatsoever with Ken Schwaber, whose company is Scrum.org, also has nothing to do with what's going on this morning. But I'm joined by uh, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, the co-creators of Scrum. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning JJ. Good morning. So um, we're going to be talking about the updates to the Scrum Guide for 2016. So first of all, I want to talk about, you know, why did you come up with a Scrum Guide in the first place? And when did that happen? Scrum started getting very, very popular first decade of 2000. And more and more books came out, more and more blogs, more and more tweets, everything. And people started arguing about what is Scrum, what isn't Scrum. And we, f we found misinterpretations of what Jeff and I had intended. So 2011, we decided to um, put out in public, very visible, um, a very simple definition of Scrum that was unambiguous, um, that just defined the framework, that didn't define you know, how you could use it, because that's very situational. But what was the framework and what were our intentions regarding Scrum? We put that out there and immediately got all these volunteers to interpret it. So I think now we have 27, 28 translations. But the intention was to give a body of knowledge, and I won't refer to Pimbach, but a, <laughs> a body of knowledge, a Scrum body of knowledge of this is it. Mm -hmm. so then if anyone says, well, no, it's this, we always refer them back to that. I think at the time I remember you uh, said Microsoft had asked you specifically, write it down so it's clear and we get people focused properly. Yes. And, and they want to use it in Microsoft Learning, so that gave them something to refer back to also. So um, there's been a lot of feedback on from the scrumguides.org site, where the new Scrum Guide is up now. If you want to go, anyone can go and download it. It's been translated into a few languages. Um, but the, you're now adding the Scrum values uh, to the Scrum Guide. We'll be talking through them. But what drove that choice? Um, we'll be talking more about user voice and how people voted on this. Um, but Scrum values are the um, lifeblood of Scrum. Scrum has artifacts, it has events, it has roles, but by itself, that's just like a skeleton, an empty skeleton. The values, the way people act, the way they interact with each other, what they care about, how they operate, um, is what makes it alive. And um, I remember this is back um, in 2000. I've worked with Jeff for a long time. And I remember back in year 2001 um, or 2000, he and I were working. He was CTO at Patient Keeper, um, a place in Cambridge that built medical devices. And he asked me to come in and, and help him with Scrum. And as I was working with them, I realized that, you know, there were some values that were really, really important for people using Scrum. And if they embraced those values, if they cherished those values, it would create a culture um, that would help people work together in small Scrum teams and lar even larger groups. And so I, I took the uh, things we found um, at Patient Keeper and we actually wrote a, a book, um, Agile Software Development with Scrum in 2001 and chapter nine, um, we refer to Patient Keeper and all those values and documented what those values were. So those values have been out there for a long time. And um, I think it's important that people understand that with them, Scrum is a place you want to live. Without them, um, it's not necessarily a place you want to be. And so when you were creating that culture at Patient Keeper, Jeff, what was your motivation for that? What, what? Well, it was the same thing uh, at, as it was at the beginning with Scrum, trying to create an environment where developers could really work together, have fun working, uh, really create great product. And to do that, everything had to be open, transparent. Everybody had to know everything that was going on. Uh, people had, need to be focused. All the values in there, all these things need to happen to make Scrum really work well. And I was really surprised out of this. I knew they had been written down a long time ago, but I, it wasn't until we were getting setting up for this meeting that I realized the last chapter of the first book on Scrum is these values. <laughs> <laughs> and it was from Patient Keeper. 
So it's fascinating how things evolve. And, and we had a, a really good um, company at Patient Keeper, and you come there and you hear people arguing and fighting with each other and struggling, but they all respected each other, they all cared about each other, and it was a wonderful place to work. When we go in and, and consult or work with organizations that respect these values that are using Scrum, you can tell it because they're great places to work when they're not embracing these values and the culture that they bring with it, um, it it's, it's very sterile. So that's why we thought it was very important to bring it into the Scrum Guide. So, um, and so we were talking, uh, Ken mentioned user voice, and this is on scrumguides.org. There is input from the community about Scrum, and how do you, how do you two view that? Well, that was one of the things that we wanted to do when we got we got everybody lined up around the Scrum Guide. People said, well, we need a place where people can have input. So that's been up there. People have been making comments regularly. Uh, and we want to, you know, slowly, incrementally focus the Scrum Guide based on feedback. And for the values, there were more people wanting the values in the, in the Scrum Guide than any other comment and feedback. So we thought that this was a good uh, time to introduce that. Um, and again, is this a change to Scrum? No, it's, it's, it's just making it clearer. As everything else we've done, we've done a couple of updates to the Scrum Guide and both of them, all three of them, have been elucidating, clarifying things that are in it. This actually puts the heart back into it. Mm -hmm. So really glad that this was so important to so many people in the Scrum community. So we're going to talk about these uh, values <clears throat> and we're going to talk about them in, in, in order of uh, how you think about them, Ken. And I think we're going to start with, uh, you, you said you really wanted to start with commitment. And uh, so, you know, what did you mean when you put this in, what, what does commitment mean to you? Um, commitment um, means that the people who are working in the Scrum team are committed to themselves, to each other, to what the organization is trying to do, and topically and very tactically, that they're committed to what they commit to in the sprint planning meeting. So when we're in the sprint planning meeting, which kicks off um, the development activities, that they're not saying, well, we'll do our best. Yeah, we'll try. Maybe we can do something about that. But they're going to do their very, very best, based on their knowledge of what they can, to do what they said they would. And, and I think that is, um, brings home the basis of iterative incremental that it's a short, short enough time period that they can commit to do their best. They know enough that they can. You know, the big thing about Scrum is it's fundamentally a process of continuous improvement, and that means change. Change is very hard. Without commitment, you can't do it. So, you know, when we go in to try to help organizations, <coughs> the first thing we need to get from people is, you know, do you want to change or not? Without a commitment to to move into the future, to do something a better way, it'll never get implemented properly. So it's commitment to the team, but also commitment to Scrum itself. Yes. It's not so, I wouldn't say Scrum itself. It's commitment to being better people, better teams, better companies. It's a commitment to take your company into the future, to make it more competitive, more successful, more rewarding to the people that work there. It's about commitment to life. I mean, it's a bigger thing than Scrum or the Scrum Guide. And, uh, and without it, you can't get there. It's a commitment to having a job, having a profession where you come to work and you enjoy it and you're doing things that fulfill you. Um, there have been several books written that the thing that people cherish the most in their lives, not necessarily wealth, not necessarily low traffic jams, but actually creating and fulfilling themselves in doing something of value. And this is what we were asking for. This, uh, the sports metaphor is a really good one, always has been for Scrum. 
without commitment, you will never win the World Cup <laughs> or the Super Bowl. It will never, never happen. You need people that are fully engaged to really be great. And that, that is my hope always been for scrum teams, that people could make a great contribution to life, to work, to their families with whatever they're doing. The commitment to failure is the one the other ones roll out from. If you're not committed, you can decommit from the other values because you don't care. Right. If you're committed, you'll, you'll keep working at it and working at it no matter how hard it is. And so the, the next value uh, is focus. And you know everyone focuses on the work of the sprint and the goals of the sprint team. So why did you put that one next after commitment to focus? You can, um, once you kick off the sprint and you've, you've committed to doing something, you can go off and do any number of things. Um, someone else's boss says, hey, can you help me over here? Hey, can you do this? I've just got a small problem. Can you come out to this customer site and help me with the sale? Um, this is a focus on the work you committed to. Now, we've got a, um, some rules in Scrum that say, you know, you're not supposed to violate the product backlog you've um, committed to. You're supposed to be working on the sprint backlog, all those things. But if you're not focused on it, um, and it's just another idea, you're not going to stay focused on it. So this is them saying, I am focused on delivering something of value the best I can, the best we can, to our product owner by the end of the sprint. So the, you know, the very first uh, implementation of Scrum that I did at Easel Corporation, we had to deliver twice the product in half the time. There's no way we were going to do that without extreme focus. Yep. So we really needed everybody to get committed to, yes, we're going to build this thing. Yes, we're going to deliver it in this tight window. Now we're going to really focus on making it happen. And then everything flows out from that. Then you start coming into, you know, we had the whole idea of commitment, other values flowing from that. Focus, other values flow from that. Why aren't why isn't everyone here? Why aren't we working on this? Why isn't everyone coming in at the same time so we can work on this stuff? Um, again, it's focus and you're either defocused and all these other things are nibbling away at the effort you can make or, as Jeff said, in sports situations, you're getting better and you're seeing yourself getting better and you're really committed to it. And so the next value is openness and you know, it's about you know the team and the stakeholders agree to be open about all the work and the challenges with performing the work, and this is a, an interesting concept of it and, and playing out in, in a modern Western corporation. But you know, why did you, you include this next? Well, yeah, you go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Well, in order to understand where you're headed, whether you're going to get there everything needed to be visible in order to get the best ideas focused in on what people are doing everybody has to have a voice and so from the very beginning we wanted to make everything transparent and uh, have the meetings be open and have everybody know everything that's going on only then can you steer things into the right direction and only then can you actually have an accurate forecast of delivery and uh, we wanted to overcome this tremendous problems we've had with traditional project development where you never know when they can deliver and when the date comes you know you're always late and often you don't know how late it is until you know as Microsoft finally said back in the uh, early 90s you know I guess it's going to be done whenever it's done I can't <laughs> tell you <laughs> but someday <laughs> we had to overcome that <laughs> so only by making visible, systematically, real things working constantly could you see steady progress towards the ultimate uh, delivery of any piece of work. Ken? We've ne we're now using better tooling. Right? So we're using application lifecycle management tooling where you see more artifacts and the relationship between them is clearer. But software development is by and large invisible. So there's no way someone can actually come over to it, look and understand how things are going. Um, this is asking people to 
share the issues they're running into, the things they're worried about, the problems they're working on, how they could help each other so they can work as a team to, to work on things which otherwise aren't visible. And this is very counterculture because we tend to not want to share what might be perceived as weaknesses or shortcomings or failures. This is saying they're not shortcomings and weaknesses, failures. Software development is very difficult. Let's talk about this. Let's work on it together. Let's see what's going on and then let's move on. Um, so it's, it's asking people to um, accept that this is a very difficult profession and share the work. Also, there's a linkage back to Lean through Professor Takeuchi and Anaka and to Taichi Ono, the founder of the Toyota Production System, who was very clear, the most important thing to know is what is your biggest problem? Because all continuous improvement that's really effective drives off of that, understanding what the biggest problem is today and how are we going to deal with that. That requires real honesty, openness, people need to be willing to trust. If you don't have that, you can't get good continuous improvement. We put in that silly thing, the daily scrum. What did you do yesterday? When, what do you need to do today? What problems are you running into? And you could run, hold one with a 10-person team in about 20 seconds. Fine, it's done, you can do more of the same. And this is saying, no, get it out there. Let's talk about what's going on so we can do something about it. So throughout, we've been trying to encourage um, almost counterculture organizations. And the, the next value is, is respect. And the Scrum team members respect each other to be capable, independent people. And sort of coming out of openness, is it, this, this leads from it? If you um, are open and you say something like we ran into at um, Patient Keeper, Wow, this is really amazing. This is a, this isn't a Microsoft database. This is a um, this is from Oracle. I don't know anything about that. What am I going to do about that? Um, and, there, and there was an opportunity where some of the people said, "Wait well, a second, you said you knew some things about things." I said, "Well, yeah, I do, but not enough to do this stuff." And there was there's a huge um, backlash of "You're a jerk. You're a liar. You're you're this." Um, and this is a respect for people as they are with their strengths and their weaknesses and trying to work with them to help them do the best you can to deliver the best product you can. It is so easy to judge other people and create dysfunctional relationships where um, you have found them inferior and you are superior and teamwork utterly falls apart at that point. So you can't have openness without respect, and there are so many companies that are run with a culture of blame. You know, they're, they're always looking around, okay, who screwed that up? And that means everybody's sitting around covering their butt, not telling the truth, trying to hide things. You can't get functional companies with that kind of environment. So in order to get the openness, people have to... Uh, respect the person for whatever they're bringing to the table and particularly if they're bringing a problem to the table you want to respect that and work on the problem and yeah. not be blaming the person and tell us the rest of the team what's going to happen what they need you to help the person whether they have to change what they've committed to to something smaller um, just critical to respect rather than getting into blame Scrum is a microcosm, a scrum team, a good scrum team is a microcosm of a good organization, a good company, a good society, a good culture. Um, th these values are critical and um, just create a great place to be and work and live. I remember in 1995, I had some lunch with a couple of venture capitalists, and they said, this would never work. You know, <laughs> this is some kind of California dreaming kind of thing. Right. Won't work in Boston. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I had to explain with it. Well, okay. You know, we do a lot of work with venture companies. And uh, I said, you know, in a venture uh, investment, you're always making the decision based on the future. Anything you've spent is gone. And if you get tied up in the history and blaming someone, it prevents you from making adequate investments. 
So a lot of these things, while they are personal, very personal, are very practical in terms of getting people and organizations actually functional. And so today, now the venture capitalists come to us and they ask us what to do, and they, we tell them and they go do it. They're, yeah. they're, they're much better than most companies at executing Scrum because they know it works and they want to make it happen. And, and it is very disruptive. You, you come into work and rather than everything going smoothly and no surprises, no expectations, no failures, instead you have hubbub. You have people finding what's not working, finding what's working, maximizing their investment, maximizing the way they treat people. Um, it creates just a completely different environment. So Jeff, Jeff's comment is extraordinarily funny. That'll never work here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then the final value uh, is, is courage. You know, Scrum team members have the courage to do the right thing and work on tough problems. Well, I think you know, any process to be open and put your problems on the table and be transparent, that requires the ability to take risk. Change takes risk, and I, I would say, you know, this is this has always been a challenge for the development teams. But today, we're seeing it very prevalent in in the management of organizations. You know, as you start to make a, move an organization from a traditional way of working into an agile way of working, the managers are afraid that their role is going to change, and many of them do not have the courage to make that transition. So it's particularly important. It's why we wrote uh, this paper in the Harvard Business Review in May on embracing Agile. It was a paper for managers and all the things that they do to block agility and some suggestions about how to open up and get things on the right track. And courage is kind of fundamental, particularly on the part of the leadership. The other values don't work without courage. You, you can't possibly um, be open and committed and focus and respect other people if you don't have the courage to take the downside. Um, something that isn't necessarily appreciated a lot in Scrum is it's got a safety net. You never are investing or, or committing to more than one sprint's worth of work. So it's not like you're having the courage to say, this is the way I think the world's going to be in the future. This is the way a billion dollars can be spent. This is the way this person's going, relationship's going to work. Instead, you're committing to that you have the courage to try this for this period of time and see how it works. It's, it's really, um, when people realize that, it, it takes a huge load off their shoulders. Waterfall, like Obamacare, something like that, what a huge risk because they didn't know it wasn't going to work until the very end and it was too late. With Scrum, you know immediately. So courage, mitigated courage, risk managed courage. How's that? <laughs> risk managed courage. Courage with the safety net. Yeah. So I'm just going to read the changes that have been made to the Scrum Guide. Uh, just so everyone knows, the Scrum Guide is up at scrumguides with an S, dot org. Um, that's in many languages already. Uh, the translations are going up in the next few days. Some of them are already there. I know Hindi, Japanese, Norwegian, Brazilian, Portuguese, Bosnian, Bulgarian, Catalan, Chinese. And I know that there are other languages that are coming. And I would encourage uh, anyone in the community. These are not done. We don't. The the you know Ken and Jeff don't hire people to do this. This is done by the community. And if you want a translation in your language, you think would be helpful, please translate. Yep. Please, and uh, put it up there on the scrumguides.org site. And the official changes read as follows. When the values of commitment, courage, focus, openness, and respect are embodied and lived by the Scrum team, the Scrum pillars of transparency, inspection, and adaption come to life and build trust for everyone. The Scrum team members learn and explore those values as they work with the Scrum events, roles, and artifacts. Successful use of Scrum depends on people becoming more proficient in living these five values. People personally commit to achieving the goals of the Scrum team. The Scrum team members have courage to do the right thing and work on tough problems. 
Everyone focuses on the work of the sprint and the goals of the scrum team. And its stakeholders agree to be open about all the work and the challenges in performing the work. Scrum team members respect each other to be capable, independent people. That's a powerful statement you two made. Scrum is a powerful thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is, the, like we said, the lifeblood of it happening and it working. We see places where it doesn't work well. Um, we find these values missing, or the values being not really followed completely. We find it's the culture that these values bring to bear, um, being intruded by typical organizational culture of blame and things like that. These are critical. Um, if you want the benefits, you adhere to the values. You embrace the values. So um, I'm going to start with some questions. We have questions from uh, people who submitted from around the globe. Um, but I, I actually wanted to start, uh, and I know you two have spoken about this in the past, uh, but as the co-creators of Scrum 20-some years ago, are you surprised by that it's gone from this thing that you two you know, came up with to a, a movement? Well, you never know when something like this is going to explode the way Scrum has. I mean, I know always knew it would work. I mean, that's why we right. got together initially. This this works. Uh, Scrum was designed to work ten times better than traditional project management. It was benchmarked for that. It was designed to do that and done right. It will do that. The only question is, can it be adopted in every country of the world? That, as it is today, no one could ever have predicted that. We, we found, as we started talking to people about Scrum and coaching them and teaching them, that this was adopted widely in the development groups. They just loved it and they adopted and they delivered software to their users. And it just spread and spread and spread because there was such desperation for working software. And then we saw it start to be adopted out in Silicon Valley and in the actual ISV community. And that really was like an imprimatur of, of success in, in that. Um, are we surprised? I don't know. Lots of things are surprising. That anything that, that um, we've done, I would have never looked back and said, of course we're going to do this. But am I surprised by it? No, because it should have done this. But how many times do you get what should happen actually happening? So it's, it's a great delight. It, it must be very rewarding. It is. Well, the, the thing that means the most to me is I, I have people coming to me fairly regularly uh, and say, you know, you've changed my life. My life was so miserable and painful uh, with the old way of working, and now the way I'm working now is so creative. Uh, you know, I'm having so much more fun. I have time to spend with my family. I mean, it's a different life I have. What? And they thank me for that. That's, that means a lot to me. I always stand there flat-footed, not knowing what to say. Um, because it's actually not what I did or you did. It's what, how they've used Scrum. They've changed their own life. Right. All we've done is create an environment where they can actually do all these hard things. So it's always a little embarrassing and a little like, well, um, or uh, well, uh, um, okay, give me five dollars or I'll take a cup of coffee. Right. <laughs> it is, you really want to turn around and say, no, thank you very much for having the nerve and the courage and the, these values to make our profession better because we need it. Jeff and I both drive um, self-driving cars. Um, so we hope to be around for a while. Um, and and that's, that runs on software. It's a computer driving a car. And so we're really glad that people are building better software. Our society needs it. Um, so this question is, uh, we got, and I'm going to mangle this name, I'm sure, from Otto Waganingen from the Netherlands. Uh, why is refinement not an event in the Scrum Guide? Well, refinement is done in many different ways. Uh, you know, actually, it was in 2013 that we really we changed the word to refinement. 
and we started to emphasize this idea of getting backlog ready before coming into sprint planning because we saw so many dysfunctional sprint planning meetings. And so really the goal of refinement is to produce ready backlog that's really ready for execution before sprint planning. And how people do it is up to them. You know, some teams will have meetings once a week, some teams will do a little bit every day. And the whole process of getting that backlog ready from the point of view of the product owners, they're, every day they're working on it, it's continual. And then periodically they'll get the development team to come in and, and, and provide estimates and input. And so it is a, a process that's going on all the time throughout the sprint. So the other thing I think, Ken, Ken has been very uh, strong at trying to keep the Scrum Guide as a minimal statement of what is absolutely essential to get Scrum to work and no more. So we're always trying to have less, not more. Why well, is that important, Ken? Well, I used to work with um, companies like Coopers and Library and Ernst and Young and IBM and their methodologies where they tried to nail down everything. And the methodologies would fill bookshelves and they're supposed to address every contingency. Yeah, and you used to sell those. <laughs> I remember. I, 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 yeah, that, was, that was the product where Jeff and I met because I had one of the first ALM products that automated those methodologies. And I remember us coming in to a company to train them on. They said, we have to do this in addition to software development. So the idea about um, these practices is there are best practices. People need to learn them, but they're situational. Um, does someone need to do story point estimating? Does someone need to do different type of estimating? Do they need to be stated as acceptance test driven development type statements? Are they requirements? Are they, you know, all these things depend upon what works best there and what the application of it is. Um, and for us to try to cover all that and give them a roadmap, a decision tree about what they should use there, I mean, Jeff and I would probably have thrown up our hands in despair by now. So uh, the next question comes from Brian Kokol from San Diego. What is the difference between a forecast and an estimate? And then following on from that, what would you say to the no estimates movement that sees little value and a lot of dysfunction with an estimate? So why don't you uh, start with the first part. What is the difference between a forecast and an estimate? This is a change you made in the last version. We, we found people, um, the users, um, the stakeholders, often uh, misinterpreting the word estimate to mean commitment. And they wouldn't, wouldn't forget, quite conveniently, that um, you make a commitment based on an estimate of what's possible, but you don't know until you get in the sprint what actually things are going to happen. And so we changed it from estimate to forecast to re-emphasize that we are going to do our very best. We're committed to do our very best. We're going to let you know what's happening. But we don't know until we get into it. We'll know better sprint by sprint by sprint about what's possible. So will you. There's velocity, there's burn downs and all that. But all these things can all go askew. We just don't know. Yeah, there's normal variation in what is deliverable that, that you, uh, Edward Stemming tried, taught the Japanese to try to manage normal variation. And yet we've seen in companies of implemented Scrum, the team says, oh, we're going to do 64 points this sprint. They do 62, and the management says, well, you guys didn't meet your commitment. You're a bad development team. Well, this creates a totally dysfunctional environment and really torpedoes all the scrum values. So you bet. That <laughs> Openness goes right down the tube. Right uh, can we go into the second part of this? Yeah, let's That's do it. really interesting. What would you say to the no estimates movement? Well, there, Rally had a survey recently of 70,000 scrum teams, and they examined what they were doing. The slowest teams on the planet, on the average, there were many, many thousands, are estimating in hours. We've been trying to get people to get rid of hours for the last 10 years, and there are still people that have trouble giving them up. They are the slowest. The next slowest are the no estimate people. Uh, we knew that, that, that uh, p particularly for newer teams, uh, it, you know, I, I, I kept on hearing, you know, this no estimates thing uh, might work okay for teams that are doing pretty well, but for new teams, it's, it's pretty dysfunctional. 
Well, it's not as bad as using ours. That's the good news. <laughs> using ours, yeah. doing no estimates would be better. But it is the next slowest. If you go up the chain and look at, okay, then suppose you use no hours, but you can actually uh, do estimate stories and you break things down by tasks, that's the next slowest. But the, the fastest teams are the uh, teams that get small stories, they estimate them points, and they burn them down. So that's what I would say to the no estimate movements. Show me the data. Okay. <laughs> the data is on the table from 70,000 scrub teams. <laughs> uh, and what it shows is that the way we're today teaching scrum, no hours, get your story small, burn down your points. Those teams are the fastest. Okay. How, how about the idea of no estimates, no valuable commitment? How do you know what you're committing to if you haven't thought through? I mean, you can estimate them and make a quarks or nanopixels or elephant um, um, whatever, but if you don't, um, haven't thought it through, your, your commitment is meaningless. So uh, the next question is from Angela Johnson from Minneapolis. Uh, Scrum trainer, uh, why do you think people make up and perpetuate anti-patterns such as sprint zero? <laughs> and if you yeah. edit, if the audience could see Ken's well, face right now, <laughs> well, you've clearly got to do a lot of planning before you start the first sprint. So you, there must be. Why do we call it sprint zero of indeterminate length and indeterminate team composition? And that would be. And suddenly, Scrum falls apart. So what we found are um, people do add-ons to Scrum, like Sprint Zero, like Stabilization Phases. Those are wonderful ones. Um, when they aren't using Scrum the way it's intended. So they're add-ons to compensate for, to support dysfunctions. <laughs> Uh, I'll just echo that. You know, the first thing people do when they start implementing Scrum is they have this problem. So let's cover up the problem by changing Scrum so the problem is okay. Yep. When and now we have a situation, you know, in Silicon Valley, 80% of the Scrum teams cannot get a potentially shippable increment of problem product at the end of a sprint. And I talked to the management out there. How can you pay all these Scrum masters and Agile coaches if they don't have working right. product at the end of a sprint. What are you thinking? This is not Scrum, this is some made up agile and name only thing that you guys are doing. And and so people, but they will call it Scrum. Oh, we have this, we have that, that, and we have the other thing to coming up, cover up the fact that we can't meet the second principle in the Agile Manifesto, which is working product at the end of a short iteration. So people do amazing things to avoid solving the most important problem there is to solve, which is get the product working at the end of every sprint. And, and we have this gap. And DevOps is a, is a famous one where at the end of the development phase, they haven't even gone to QA. So, and yet they're supposedly using Scrum. Um, that was in um, the key DevOps book. But we find, go to conferences, we hear people talking about continuous delivery, continuous integration, um, and yet they don't have a definition of done. We have all these new practices, and yet they aren't consistently being used. So we're in a conference, we're in a meeting, and people say, can, can, you, can you tell me about blah, 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 and it's some sort of mess or dysfunction, you say, um, first, can you tell me what your definition of done is? Did you deliver a completely done increment at the end of the last sprint? If not, you know, <laughs> leave me alone, go do your work, and then come back. Because it's so fundamental. Um, this uh, question, the uh, next question comes from uh, Jürgen Weisbaden from Germany. It says, uh, currently the Scrum Guide doesn't say a lot about scaling. Uh, do you intend to add some more details about scaling fundamentals, which should be considered in order to ease orientation for Scrum extending varying frameworks? Well, Ken and I have been scaling Scrum for 20 years, and we haven't had any problems. But now, all of a sudden, there are all these scaling frameworks. And some of them have good ideas, but a lot of them 
actually distort Scrum. You know, they're inconsistent with the Scrum Guide. They introduce I, things like sprint zeros and hardening sprints and introduce a lot of waste into the system. So, uh, you know, we think uh, scaling Scrum is situational to the company. It's something that you can't prescribe in a guide, although there are people that are trying to do that. Uh, different companies have different values, different targets, different uh, strategies, and depending on uh, depending on the company, the situation, the strategy, the product, that's going to change their whole approach to expanding Scrum widely in the organization. So, um, Scrum as a minimal document, does, Scrum Guide as a minimal document, does not have things about release planning. There's a lot of ways to do that. It does not have things about scaling. And it does not have a uh, it do, it does not have a lot of thing about techniques that may be useful but are always changing and getting better. Is there anything to add to that, Ken? One of the favorite questions I get about scaling is someone said, "Well, we have this critical project and we have 800 people and we need to know how to scale it." And I said, "Well, how do you know you need 800 people?" And they have no answer. No answer. <laughs> well, they, they gave me 800 people. <laughs> so uh, this is from Wolfgang from Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, over the last 20 years, what are the major changes, if any, you see in how Scrum is being applied? Well, I, I think the thing that is, is most interesting is Scrum has expanded so tremendously. It's like when anything expands this much, it gets watered down and you get, it, it, it's more and more of a challenge to keep people focused, to keep them committed, <laughs> to keep them open, <laughs> and to get them having the courage to actually get better and, and, and improve. And so, you know, the biggest change for me is the huge scale at which this is going on and how to get it uh, better and improve it. The other thing that's happening is I was in Berlin a month ago and uh, working with a conference with Fortune magazine and they said you have to come to dinner and we met okay. in we met in the boardroom of Deutsche Bank and in the room were three people from the German Parliament two of the senior political leaders um, of Berlin uh, a defense minister and they said, basically, our goal is to make uh, Germany, but particularly Berlin, a global center of technical excellence on the planet. Uh, we need to hire the best people in the world. We need to produce the best products. And how do we get the company, and particularly Berlin, agile? And we talked about what laws they would need to change. Uh, the initiatives, I talked to him how, how I, had, I, I advised the Department of Defense in the United States uh, on implementing the congressional law that they be agile. And uh, they went out of there committed to really radically alter things in the political framework of Germany and particularly the city of Berlin. So these are things that we would, uh, I would never have expected 20 years ago, that we're actually changing countries now. Jen? If I go back to when Jeff and I first started working on Scrum in 1995, software was not prevalent. You, know, you had your PCs and some of them, you could send files back and forth or you could use a modem, but it was not an infrastructure of our society. It now holds our society and the world together. Um, you think about things like smart grid, you think about the way people work together, you think about the financial networks, it is all held together and run by software. If you imagine that having happened using waterfall, you stop dead, it wouldn't have happened. So I think as, our, as the number of people have um, increased in the world, as the complexity and, and for whatever it's worth globalization has occurred, it wouldn't have happened without the initial ideas, the kernel in Scrum, to make it happen. It was frozen dead. 
And now, even though it may not be called Scrum, you know, like we see people using the ideas behind it and the permission it gives them to act reasonably and sensibly. Um, I think it, it is the enabler. Okay, well, um, that wraps up our uh, pr presentation for today. I encourage anyone listening to go to uh, scrumguides.org where you can see the update yourself. Um, and if you ha have suggestions for more changes, obviously Jeff and Ken do pay attention to the community. Uh, you can go to scrumguide.uservoice.com and you know leave your suggestions there. Um, and uh, again, if there are languages that you know, it has not been translated into, if, if you would like to step forward and do that, uh, this, the whole Scrum community would be grateful for that. Um, this uh, presentation will be uh, edited and put on the web uh, in a, probably in the next week or two, um, and we will let all of you know when that happens. Uh, but thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you for uh, listening to this extraordinary conversation between the two people that have created a movement, uh, a process, a, a way of doing things that has fundamentally reshaped how we work.